pages. There's there's there's, <laughs> um, there's two kinds of seeds, your plants that you're going to potentially save seeds from. You can save seeds from perennials too, and we'll get to that when we talk a little bit about the, the native plants. Um, but annuals, things like corn, beans, peas, tomatoes, peppers, those can all be saved from the first year, and they're pretty easy to save seeds from because they produce those seeds that first year. Biennials, on the other hand, they can be a little bit trickier because they typically don't produce seeds until the second year. So they're things like cabbages and cauliflower, onions, beets, carrots. Um, those are all a little bit trickier because they typically aren't going to survive our winters here. So they typically have to be dug up <laughs> and um, put in like a root cellar for the winter, or you have to like really heavily mulch them to try to get them to overwinter here. Um, so they're a little bit bigger challenge. Um, sometimes your onions, especially onion sets, will flower and produce seed the first year. Um, but for the most part, these are a little bit trickier to get to produce seeds in the first year. They really more are going to naturally want to do that the second year. Um, different seed saving strategies. So pollination method actually really matters. So you have a bunch of things that are self-fertile, which means they're gonna, the flowers are complete and they have the male and female parts all within them. And they don't take much to, to fertilize themselves and produce seeds, them, the, the seeds all by themselves. So peas, beans, lettuces, tomatoes, they are all self-fertile. Um, then you have wind pollinated things like corn, beets, spinach, chard. Um, um, again, they're, they're, they will do a lot of the pollination for themselves, but um, they, that is one instance where you might want to isolate them um, to ensure that they maintain their variety. Um, the insect pollinated things like asparagus, carrots, celery, celery, eggplant, okra, onions, parsley, parsnips, hot peppers, spinach, those um, are all ones that are insect pollinated. And so you actually kind of want to control the pollination that's happening there instead of having an insect or a bee go from, you know, plant to plant to plant um, and potentially spreading pollen to your plants that you're going to save seed from that uh, are going to contaminate or cross things that you don't want them to. Um, there's a whole list of coal crops and vine crops that are all in that same insect pollinated realm. Um, and then there are kind of ones that can be wind, human, or insect pollinated. And again, you want to control the pollination of those. So with, uh, this is a, a picture of a um, squash plant and you have the, this is the male flower and this is the female flower. And you can tell because this one just has a really nice stem. It has the nice long um, stem as the male flower. And then the female flower, you can actually see the fruit is starting to actually form just a little bit there at the base of the, the plant and they don't have a nice long stem. Um, so some strategies you can um, avoid um, to avoid the, the, the uncertain pollination uh, or cross pollination, you can grow one crop of, uh, only grow one variety of each crop. Um, that's a good solid strategy because assuming that you don't have like a neighbor right next door <laughs> that's also growing other varieties, um, but if it's you're somewhat isolated, you can do that. Um, you can grow two varieties that are going to pollinate at different times. So if you alter the planting date, you do an early planting of something and then a later planting of something, chances are pretty good that they're not going to cross pollinate. Um, and then you can also protect those buds um, and the plants from cross pollination. So here you can see that the flowers have been like physically <laughs> stopped from opening. Um, and so in that case, what you would do um, is you're going to use some kind of um, isolation method. Um, row cover is a really good option. And this is kind of like a spun woven fabric that um, is air and water permeable, light permeable, but it's going to keep insects out that could potentially cross pollinate things. Um, there's also the sort of uh, polyester voile that um, is, can, is also a really fine fabric that you can get at fabric stores and you can uh, make bags out of that. Um, our favorite are the organza gift bags or the <laughs> blossom bags is what we call them. Um, and they come in different sizes for different types of uh, flowers that you might be covering. The like seven and a half are really good for um, bigger squash blossoms versus Tiny flowers are really good for the, the little four inch ones. And those are nice um, because they just are nice and small. Um, there's also like a polyester tool bag that I cut my picture got cut off there. It's basically a big rectangle um, that you would put over the whole 
molta lettuce plant like this. Um, and that's just made out of that, that kind of tool uh, material that's really nice. And you can see it goes over the whole plant and all that pollen is gonna get kept inside with the flowers and then it'll cross itself, um, but you don't have to worry about other pollen getting in there. Um, so here you have a male cucumber flower. Um, again, there's, there's um, a little bit of a stem, but not too much versus the female you can see is already kind of got that um, fruit starting to form. And so um, typically what you do is you're gonna cover up <laughs> Um, the, the female, so here's the, the female flower, ready for isolation, um, ready to be hand pollinated early tomorrow. So we put the, the bag over it to keep it from uh, opening up and getting exposed to other pollen by insects. Um, oh, I thought I had a picture of the, oh, I missed one. But basically you can take a, um, like a, a Q-tip and just go in and collect the pollen from the, the male flower and then add it to the female flower and then put that back on, put the organza bag back on until the fruit starts to form. And then typically you want to um, uh, mark that. Like obviously once the fruit starts to form, it's not gonna get pollinated anymore, but you wanna like mark that, that one so you don't accidentally harvest it uh, when you're harvesting all the other cucumbers because that's the one you're gonna wanna let get really, really ripe, overripe to harvest from, to get the seeds from. So other seed saving strategies um, are growing different species of the same genus. They're less likely to cross, like there's four different squash uh, species within um, the, the same genus. And so if you grow, you know, two of those, they're gonna be less likely to cross. Um, bull, bird, birds and mold are the biggest enemies for seed savers. So that's something to keep consider. Like, um, you know, <laughs> the, the, the other thing is squirrels a lot of times, like people will be like, okay, I'm just about ready to harvest my sunflower seeds and then the squirrels get them the next day. So um, even using like a pillowcase to cover up stuff and protect it from birds and uh, squirrels and things that can be really helpful. Um, seeds typically have to be mature to be saved. We talked about that. And some seeds can really just be saved by stripping them out of the, the fruit or the pod as well. Um, there's also fermentation that can happen. Um, this is with things that are typically wet seeded. So tomatoes, cucumbers, melons, anything that has that kind of slimy seed coat that needs to be uh, fermented off to prepare the seeds for seed saving. Um, I have saved tons and tons of tomato seeds <laughs> in the last 10 years. Um, and typically what I like about it is you just take an, uh, you, you know, cut up the tomato, scoop out the seeds and the pulpy goo, put them in a cup, add some water, let it sit for, I would say anywhere from four to eight days. Um, I like to sometimes put some mesh over the top because if this is usually in August when I'm doing this and there's all kinds of insects that could like want to get in there and be attracted to it. So if you put some mesh over it, that'll protect that. But they're going to get funky and moldy and kind of smelly. Um, and that's actually what you want to have happen. You want it to actually... Uh, ferment and get that goo off of each seed. And then basically you just add more water and swish it around and pour off the mold and keep rinsing the seeds until they're, it's just seeds that are in the cup. Um, and the seeds kind of sink as opposed to everything else floats. <laughs> and so it's really easy to just, um, once you've got the clean seeds, you can just pour them off and dry them on a coffee filter and then you're all set. Um, you can see I've got like labels of you know, making sure those things are labeled as you, as you harvest them so you can keep track of what's what, really, really important. Um, you wanna make sure that you're keeping seeds dry. You can dry them on coffee filters. I like to store save seeds with desiccant packs. Um, and again, don't forget to label them with all the um, important information, the crop name, the variety, any useful notes about the source of the, the seeds, uh, when you harvested them, the date, how many plants you harvested from. <laughs> All those kinds of things. Um, and then there's the kind of question of like, well, how long are these seeds gonna last? So the ideal conditions for saving seeds um, is kind of cool and dry. And so um, you want like, ideally would be uh, desiccant packs in a Ziploc bag in your refrigerator. So it's gonna like keep the moisture down, but it's gonna be nice and cool. 
Um, those are kind of the cool dry conditions where the seeds are gonna last the longest. If you just have them at room temperature, a lot of them will still last several years. Um, I've had tomato seeds last 10 years <laughs> and still be pretty viable. So um, there's definitely some strategy of keeping them cool and dry to keep them lasting a long time. Um, and then if you have questions about, you know, how many, um, how viable are the seeds? If you've got really old seeds sitting around, you can always do a ragdoll test where you take a wet paper towel and put like 10 seeds on it, roll it up, let it sit for 10 days in a plastic bag, unroll it, and then you can count and say like, okay, you know, five of the 10 germinated. So that means I've got 50% germination. I'm going to plant this. So I want to plant it doubly, however thick I want it to come up uh, in the garden. So. Any questions about any of that? Ah, there were a couple questions that came through the chat. Uh, quick one here. Do you ever use a window screen? A window screen for like uh, cleaning the seeds? I'm assuming. Mm, Brianna, feel free to- or A window screen your... for isolating. Uh, I didn't say, but Brianna, if you want to okay. unmute yourself and clarify. For drying. For drying? Yeah, you could definitely dry them on window screen. That would definitely work. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question, I think you might've answered after it came in, but can you pick one or two plants from the vine to isolate for seeds and leave the rest just to grow for eating, thinking squash yep. specifically? Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no problem. And if there are other questions, feel free to- I come on in. <laughs> Um, so again, just like why save seeds? These are all those reasons that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and for us with the Minnesota Seed Project, it really was this like, okay, this is something we can encourage people to do, uh, you know, during the pandemic and, and get people engaged. Everybody wants to be in their garden anyway. <laughs> why not like start having people save seeds, learn how to save seeds and really um, utilize that resource and each other and kind of create this community of seed savers. That was really our our goal from the get-go. Um, and then we got approached in uh, fall of 2020 um, to think about doing, um, oops, to think about um, collecting seeds from native plants. Um, we had a couple different sites that we uh, had connections to that um, had native plantings. And we thought, well, you know what, this is a great opportunity to, to try this out and see how it goes. Um, we were able to actually apply for funding from the Capital Region Watershed District and get funding for this project this last year. Um, and so this is myself, Stephanie, and Don, that I was telling you about early. Um, and this is our, our project this last year. So we, in 2021, we focused on this community native plant science project. Um, for some reason, my, oops, jumping ahead. Um, and so the, the idea here was really to um, try to create this, this regionally adapted seeds and create a local seed economy um, and a community of practice around seed saving skills. So what we did is we, um, the three of us came together to create this project. Um, and the first thing that we did was focused on sort of native plant identification. Um, we had a webinar that was done by Karen Jokola um, with the Xerxes Society. And we, um, you know, basically talked through, I must have this on like some kind of auto uh, advance, I apologize. It's kind of goofy. Um, I don't know why it's doing that, but um, so we did this and uh, let me go back here. There you are. <laughs> sorry, sorry about this. Oh man. Okay, so uh, we did a native plant identification webinar and taught people like basically how to identify the plants that they have in their garden, they have nearby, locally. And one of the best tools that we found for doing this was iNaturalist. iNaturalist is an app that uh, you can use it on your computer, you can use it on your phone. Um, Hang on one second. <laughs> I'm just gonna pause for a moment. 
and turn off this very annoying uh, Now can I share my, oh, can you put me as host for one more second so I can <laughs> share my screen again? I'm sorry. <sighs> no problem. Technology is its own set of problems. Let's see here. Uh, make you the host. Okay. Perfect. And then if you just make me the host again, once you've shared your screen. Deal. Oh. Make host. Okay. There we go. Thanks. Whew. Okay. So what we found is that iNaturalist is this really great tool for people to use to identify plants. Um, it does a really good job of sort of, you take a picture of it and uh, it will sort of suggest what it could possibly be. And then it, you can post it. And then you have other people that can like, who are experts in that type of plant will verify that, yes, that's what it is. Um, we love iNaturalist. We actually created a iNaturalist orientation where we taught people how to use iNaturalist. Um, and then we also had um, an iNaturalist project that we created specifically for our project where we could track the observations both in Minnesota and specifically in the Capital Region Watersheds. I don't know why it's still doing that. <sighs> okay. Um, it, hopefully I'll just have to I don't know, fight with it, I guess. Um, so we were able to, you know, I do identify all these different unique plants by having people join our, our projects. We had 45 people join it um, and used it. And then we pretty much started collecting seeds. So Monarch City is this really cool uh, park in St. Paul. Uh, it's like the West Minnehaha Rec Center, and there's these, all these little athletic fields, and the ring around the athletic fields is all planted to native plantings, and they were pretty much labeled pretty well for us, um, so it was really easy to collect seeds from those plants, um, and it, you know, was just a really great opportunity to get, get outside and do something active, um, and collecting seeds was just lots of fun. Um, at the same time, we were teaching people giving them these kind of tips for collecting seeds. So uh, even though Monarch City is kind of a gorilla planting, <laughs> uh, we had permission from the gardeners to collect from there, which is important. Um, we used iNaturalist to confirm what the plants were if we didn't know what they were. Um, typically you wanna take about every fifth seed head and leave the rest behind. So you're only taking about 20% of the seeds that are there. Um, and we were using lots of paper envelopes and bags. And we had these really great aprons and. Um, I felt like a kangaroo mama with all of these pouches <laughs> full of envelopes when at the end of these seed collection events. They were lots of fun. Um, we also had, oops, I think I jumped ahead there. Uh, again, the labeling, really, really important. We, were, we would give everyone a, an envelope that had a, you know, an example of how to label things with the common name, the scientific name, the, the date, the location, the number of plants, and their initials um, of the harvester. And then we also think that it's really important to sort of have that same like leave no trace ethic for seed saving as well, where you, you know, want to make sure that there's no evidence that you were there when you were done and that, um, you know, you're staying on pathways and not trampling the plants that you're not collecting seeds from because um, you don't want to do any harm that way. Um, then we moved on to Gibbs Farm. Um, and we did uh, a seed collection there. They have a beautiful like one and a half acre prairie planting that we were able to collect seeds from. Um, just lots of great diversity, um, really great opportunity to like be able to show people how easy it is to collect seeds from native plants. Um, then uh, the Capital Region Watershed District, they were our uh, host in terms of the funding for this project. They have these amazing plantings that are all around their kind of headquarters. And so we collected seeds from their um, site on two different occasions in the late summer and in uh, September and October. It was nice to actually go back to a place because they're the, usually the first time you get there, there are things that are just not ready yet. 
Um, and so you, when you go back a second time, then those seeds are ready and you can collect from them. And that's always fun. Um, we went and we actually ended up going back to Gibbs Farm for uh, the Apple Festival and we set up a like communal seed cleaning um, site. <laughs> so we had all these picnic tables with all kinds of sieves and uh, containers and we were winnowing things um, and, you know, with the wind uh, and teaching kids and families how to, to save seeds, how to clean those seeds, how to process them. Um, and then also doing some more collecting. I know that there was like, there was a blazing star that I had found the first time that I was there and I'd put it on my naturalist. And then when I went back, I was able to find it again and collect seed from it. So that was very exciting. Um, we also partnered with Urban Roots. So they have a, they're a youth program in St. Paul that does um, programs with, uh, they have like a market garden program. They have a food program. And then they also have a conservation program. And uh, David um, Woods, the, the conservation program manager, he had a ton of seeds to clean and we had a ton of seeds to clean after all these events. So we all brought our seeds together and we had the kids cleaning seeds. We had our participants cleaning seeds, uh, watching each other with different tools and tricks. Um, they had this awesome like bucket thresher with, which is a five gallon bucket and a uh, corded drill bit. <laughs> with some chains on it uh, and a cordless drill. And you would basically like put the seeds in there and then go and then it would, and then you could like thresh those seeds and uh, winnow them and clean them. And it was very fun. Uh, we also had Vanessa, who's one of our friends there. She had, she has this kind of do it yourself uh, seed aspirator that cleans seeds faster than uh, any way I'd ever seen. Um, it was basically powered by a vacuum and uh, was super, super cool. It, like the, the seeds kind of dropped down here and all the chaff kind of went, um, let's go over here. The, the seeds would drop down here and then they, you could like control the suction by covering this up um, and it would pull all the chaff this way. Uh, and it was just super cool um, to see that and to get to, and it's like the top of my wish list of things that I want next. <laughs> um, and then I need to figure out how to build. Um, we also had David do a webinar for us on how to grow natives from seed. Um, and that's available on YouTube. All of the, the webinars that we created are all available on our, our website on the northerngardener.org um, Minnesota Seed Project website. Um, and that was just a really great way to, he showed us about, you know, if you need to scarify seeds, how to do that. If you need to do cold stratification for a lot of these seeds, because a lot of these seeds are native perennials that are used to like spending the winter outside before they start growing. And so how to trick them into, you know, getting cold enough for long enough so that they'll grow. Um, and it was just really fun and cool. And that's a really great webinar that's available uh, for free on our YouTube channel. So check that out too. Um, then we did a bunch of seed distributions. So we had um, seed distributions both in the spring and the fall. We were able to um, use little free library cabinets for the spring seed distributions. Um, and then we did a seeds, a virtual seed swap um, via email in the fall. Um, we had, you know, produced, <laughs> distributed lots and lots of seeds, which was just really fun and exciting. Um, volunteer time, obviously this, this was a big effort um, and lots and lots of people contributed a lot of time to this project, um, which was really exciting. We collected over <laughs> almost a quarter of a million seeds, you know, just a few, uh, worth over a thousand dollars if we had had to purchase them. And so that's something that I think is really, really valuable. And now we have all these seeds that we can continue to, to distribute um, and give to different project participants going forward as well. Um, so, you know, obviously huge thanks to the Capital Region Watershed District for making all of this possible. Um, what's next in 2020? Two, uh, we just found out that um, we got a stewardship grant for the Capital Region Watershed District to continue our seed collection events, our seed distributions, and we're gonna work on creating a seed hub of activities in the Frogtown neighborhood of St. Paul. Um, we've also applied for additional funds to um, get outside of the Capital Region Watershed District. There's a lot of cool <laughs> opportunities outside of St. Paul. Um, and we really want to focus on community garden sites and teaching 
people at community gardens how to save seeds from both natives and herbs and flowers and veggies and all that kind of pieces um, and other native planting sites as well. Um, we've been able to create a relationship with a farm that's out by Stillwater that um, has like a five acre prairie. And it's just like, I feel like a kid in his candy store when I go there, because it's just like, you know, the buffet of, of flowers and uh, grasses to collect from is just amazing. And so uh, we want to continue working with them to, to have events as well. And then lastly, we really want to kind of work on uh, having more pollinator identification series with the Minnesota State Horticulture Society with practice sites at gardens. I got to do one of those um, workshops last year with the Xerxes Society, and it was so much fun uh, just to know, you know, the 10 different main different kinds of pollinators and where they where they habitate habitats are and what they, the plants they're attracted to. And uh, so we want to do more of that. So are there any other questions? I kind of flew through that. Yeah, so backing up to tomatoes, uh -huh. um, Betsy said it's so interesting about the tomato seeds. She's noticed some cherry tomato varieties that like to volunteer the following year in the garden. And she's mm -hmm. wondering, are they just like fermenting on their own before they show up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, will, they don't necessarily, like if they have a little bit of that goo stuck to them, they're still going to potentially grow. They just might be inhibited by it. So removing it is ideal if you're going to save seeds from them. Gotcha. Yeah. Ah, we have another question. Do different pepper varieties cross pollinate like poblanos and jalapenos? Yes. <laughs> In fact, I had this beautiful heirloom uh, variety of deeply lobed peppers that were sweet. It was a sweet variety and I totally loved them and they were amazing. And I thought, oh, I'll just save these seeds. <laughs> and the next year I regrow them and they were beautiful lobed peppers that were spicier than all get out because they had obviously crossed with some other hot pepper that I had way too close to it. Uh, so yeah, they, they can. So that's definitely something you want to isolate and be aware of. And uh, yeah. Awesome. There's another question here around like the legality of saving seeds. Mm. Is there anything um, that people should know before they dive into seed saving? Are there ways that you could be in legal trouble or taken to court for saving seeds? Okay, so it's like the, the biggest legal trouble that you're going to get in with saving seeds is with genetically modified seeds. Uh, it's almost impossible to buy those by accident. In fact, it is. It's impossible to buy those by accident. Uh, you can pretty much only buy those as a farmer in bulk. Uh, so I, you kind of don't have to worry about that issue most of the time in your garden. Uh, that said, you there are like protected varieties. So anything that you buy that has like a trademark, you don't want to save seed from because um, that's not legal. Like just like you wouldn't, if it was a trademark plant, you wouldn't, you know, divide it and share it with all your friends usually. <laughs> Um, you're going to, you know, it's, there's the same, the same, it's the same sort of legality issues with that for anything that's trademarked. Um, anything that has like a specific variety name to it um, along those lines, I think, you know, I mean, obviously the tomatoes have variety names, but um, if they're open pollinated seeds, then they're, they're fair share to, to collect seeds from. Yeah. Uh Another question here, this is more logistical, but um, are you able to share your slides with us or send us the links that you had referenced in your slides? Definitely. So those in our newsletter. Awesome. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. That'd be, yeah, for sure. Here, I can put the next slide up there with the awesome. that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, does anyone else have questions? Feel free to unmute and ask or type them in the chat bar. And as, as people are thinking about that, I can just talk a little bit more about MSHS, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Cool. So um, Minnesota State Horticulture Society has an affiliated membership level, uh, which I think it's $37, which is such a good deal <laughs> um, compared to the $62 society membership level. But basically anybody who's a part of a garden club, like your uh, herbal herbalist guild is counts. So you could all have access to that. Um, membership level, you get the Northern Gardener Magazine, you get discounts on all the participating garden centers and wineries that are discount partners. 
discounts on classes and workshops and events, um, lots of, you know, cool, cool uh, webinars that we're hosting. Um, and then we have a really great e-news that comes out uh, twice a month that um, has all kinds of great gardening info and things that are happening. Um, some of the other programs that I run are the Garden in a Box kits. Um, these are basically kits that we partner with nonprofit uh, organizations to uh, distribute so that they can start gardens. So they are um, these circle beds, they get the bed, they get the soil, they get the compost, they get the plants, they get the seeds, they get the tomato cages, they get fertilizer, everything they need. They have, you have to, they have to supply like water and labor, <laughs> like everything else we provide. Um, and so that's a really great program. Um, I have the old due date, but it's coming up March 18th, 2022 is when the applications are due. So if you know somebody who has, who's at a school, a daycare center, uh, after school program, summer camp program, a treatment center, anybody who um, could utilize this program, um, it's all paid for by grants. Um, so we're really kind of focused on low income people who can't, who maybe couldn't have this opportunity otherwise. Um, and that's an exciting program. Um, we have another program called Minnesota Green, where if you're involved with the community garden, this is a really great opportunity or really any kind of public garden space. So this again, could be a school garden, it could be a church garden, it could be a boulevard garden, it could be anything that's in kind of a, this isn't for private backyards, it's for public garden spaces. Um, and so we um, work with plant sales and garden centers and nurseries um, and anybody who's kind of getting rid of plants. So if you guys do a plant swap and you have a bunch of plants left over afterwards, give me a call. <laughs> I will find homes for those plants. Um, so we work with groups, they donate the plants. Um, we have a huge seed donation uh, to distribute. It's probably starting next week um, that we, you know, basically providing and supporting all these different gardens all over the state, which is really kind of fun. Um, the Northern Gardener Magazine, if you're not familiar with that, that's another really great resource. Um, we also have a blog that has a lot of the articles online for free that you can access. Um, we've been working really hard for the last, gosh, almost two years uh, to create a resource hub of all kinds of great horticulture uh, information for, you know, our cold climate specific gardening information. It's another really great resource. Uh, we also have pollinator packs that you can find at a lot of garden centers and plant sales that um, are specific for pollinators. So specific for bees, butterflies, or hummingbirds. Um, so if you want to, you know, get more plants for pollinators in your garden, that's a really great way. And there's a portion of the sales that come back to the Hort Society and support our programs as well. And I think that's all I have. So if there are other questions, I'll go back to that. Um, Wow, so many cool programs and ways to get yeah involved. uh brianna i saw you had your hand up oh there i see you typed in the chat uh brianna says i'm planning on doing raised beds i was thinking metal water troughs because the garden gets so overgrown with weeds my question is do you think it's an okay idea to fill it with logs at the bottom and soil on top i think you're still gonna want some kind of drainage just in case we have like a five inch rainstorm <laughs> It can happen in Minnesota every once in a while. Um, so, so putting some uh, drainage holes in the bottom of that container is going to be important. But otherwise, yeah, there's all this like huga culture um, methods where you um, you can actually soak logs and put them in the base, especially if it's deep enough. Like even I would say if it's at least a foot and a half deep, that works pretty well. Um, soak the logs and then put them down in there with. You can put leaves. You can put any kind of organic material down in the bottom and then make sure you have some top soil or garden soil compost at the top, probably at least the top six to eight inches, I would say, um, cause that'll give you a good base. And then the, that, that'll actually, those that organic matter underneath will break down and it'll feed your soil for a really long time. Um, I have a neighbor that did that with raised beds in their boulevard and they've, they almost never have to fertilize them cause they just are very uh, healthy with the soil breaking down. Awesome. Um, Betsy wonders, I just gathered some yellow dock seeds today to grow microgreens, which I've done before, but was wondering if there's an optimal time to gather them. Like, should I have gathered them in the fall instead for optimal vitality? I also do this with garlic mustard seeds to grow microgreens. 
Nice. My hurricanes are great. I love that. Um, you know, I mean, yes, there's probably an ideal window. Um, are we past that? That's hard to say. Like, I think it'd be kind of an interesting activity to like go out and early fall, like, you know, as soon as they've dried down and collect some and then collect some throughout the winter and see if that actually changes the, the germination, uh, you know, that you get from the seeds. Um, Cause I would think that it's probably gonna be pretty steady as long as it's all the same year, uh, it shouldn't change too much but it might be affected a little bit by the, the cold too. And, um, but again, those, those are seeds would all normally be outside anyway. So, yeah. Uh, Luann is wondering if you have any insight uh, or advice about jumping worms and mm. how to deal with both avoiding them or getting rid of them. Um, if you have them, you should definitely contact the U and get in on uh, the early info that they're putting out about um, trying to figure out ways to control them, because that's definitely still a big unknown. Um, in terms of trying to avoid them, you know, when you guys do your plant swap, you should probably be washing all those roots and um, swapping bare root things, because they, they the eggs can overwinter in the soil, um, they can be present, and um, I just watched a whole big, the I think the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency had a no, it was the Minnesota Composters Association or something like that. They had a webinar um, in the last week on jumping worms and talking about it. And it's just really challenging. Like um, they're, they're, they're not ubiquitous yet, but they potentially may get to that point um, here. And we really don't want that to happen. So avoiding, you know, trade with Minnesota Green, I collect the plants from nurseries, but for individuals, a lot of times I'm like, you know, they have to be potted in potting soil um, because we have to make sure that it's a sterile media that's not going to spread them. And uh, that's important. So yeah, that it's a challenge for sure. Thank you. Uh, Sylvie chimed in and says, I live in Crystal, Minnesota. I'm looking to inspire my neighbors to grow more native pollinators and have information on how to winterize your garden as pollinator friendly. I was considering making a pamphlet to distribute to some free seeds. Do you have a service I can use to get free seeds for this or any input? Um, I would say it should be an email. I do have some seeds from the, the Minnesota Seed Project that we could share um, to that degree. Um, there's also the Como Community Seed Library has a bunch of seeds from our seed collecting as well that are in their library that can be, you know, checked out, which is kind of fun. Um, but yeah, definitely let me know. Awesome. Any other questions? Feel free to type them in. Otherwise, we're getting all sorts of uh, positive feedback here. These programs make my heart happy. Uh, <laughs> me too. How wonderful. She keeps going with more amazing programs. So that was really cool to hear about. Um, and yes, we'll absolutely have to be uh, careful with our plant swap and do a bare root plant swap for our, our second time. Or just bare root, like washed off and then potted in potting soil, you know. Oh, and okay. That's, that, that works too. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Um, anyone else have questions or things they want to chime in here before we wrap? Give it a minute for the chat to see if anyone's typing. Oops. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Uh, this was lovely. Uh, we really enjoyed having you and I'm feeling so excited to get started planting my seed. Um, yeah, I see Sylvie asked, how can we help? I'd say, you know, joining the Hort Society is a huge um, way to support these programs. Um, that's definitely, you know, we also do donations specifically for Garden in a Box or Minnesota Green. If you have anything like that that can help, that's awesome. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming, for sharing. Uh, we'd love to get links to the things you referenced in your slides or just copies of the slides, whatever is easy for you. And we yeah. can get those out in our newsletter. Uh, but thanks everyone for coming, our first meeting of the year. It's so good to, to see your faces. Thanks for tuning in. Um, 
As a reminder, we're a nonprofit organization. So if you're not a member yet, you can head over to our website and join. Um, and it's okay if you don't wanna be a member or can't be a member right now. Uh, we do take donations for individual <laughs> lectures, um, but thanks so much for being here. It's good to be with you. And we'll hope to uh, gather in person as the weather warms up this spring. Next month, March 9th is our second meeting. So stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you for coming. Have a lovely night. Thank you, Courtney, for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming.